Good morning. Good morning. Sorry, we had a bit of a technical issue. The signal went a little bit low. I think it's because there is an absolute massive rain cloud yeah. that has suddenly mm. come in. You were just saying, weren't you? Oh, it's not going to rain today. No, no, it looks no. Nice and I, sunny. Think, I think it was maybe I my was... signal that went a bit low. I'm, my signal's feeling a bit low this morning. Feeling a bit drained. Yeah. You yeah. need to be recharged a little I bit. Need to, if I could possibly plug myself into anything at the moment and recharge myself, I'd be straight at the socket, I can tell you that. Anyway, those peregrines are looking good. They are looking fantastic. And if you remember yesterday, we said that the Wakefield Cathedral were collecting data on these peregrines and the eggs would always hatch either 33 or 34 days after incubation began. Yesterday was day number 33. Mm. Today is day number 34. We were watching, weren't we, just before we went live yep. to see what was going on. And we had hoped that when we were live, we would see the switch over because it's the female that incubates the eggs throughout the night. The male will then come in in the morning and take over that incubation. So we were hoping we'd be able to show you that live. However, they did it just before we went, of course, typically. And we took a good look at those eggs to see if any had hatched. Yeah, so it's, I, do you know what? I, I, I'm slightly confused because I thought it was the male that was on there and there'd already been a changeover and then the bird that comes in. It's quite difficult to see the scale there. So, uh, well, maybe I just had a very bad night. But one <coughs> thing that we could see quite clearly is that all four eggs appear mm. to be intact. Yeah. Now, of course, the process of hatching isn't something quick. The birds don't just break out of the egg instantaneously. Mm. The young bird is using an egg tooth on the top of its bill, a tiny <coughs> horny sheath, which is there just for the process of hatching. It lasts for a few days after hatching, and then it falls off and is never seen again. Um, and, it, and it goes in a circle around the inside of the egg to, to try and open it. Sometimes the adults will assist. But the little hole in the egg, which could be there just on one could side be. and we can't see it, mm. is... Um, it is, it is tricky to see. So keep your eyes mm. on those Wakefield peregrines throughout the course of the day. Today is very probably the day. Yeah, it's going to be the day. And then also it's likely that at least two others will hatch within this 24-hour period. Well, the 24-hour period of the first one hatching. So it could be quite a busy period worth keeping your eyes on mm. those peregrines. We've been watching them all week. and We have to say thanks to Karen, Colin and Francis who have liaised with us from the Wakefield Peregrines Project. You can obviously find this uh, camera on YouTube and also by visiting their website, Wakefield Peregrine. So thanks for all of your help. Hope it continues to go well. We'll keep an eye on it, of course. We're mm -hmm. not going to abandon your peregrines. No. no, it wasn't. OK, so first of all, the gannet beak was way too easy. Everyone got the gannet beak. Then we tried harder with the uh, the, the pink legs, thinking that everyone would go for, for, for flamingo. But people got black wings still. Yeah. Yesterday, mm -hmm. the close-up, the, the, the tiny part of the snowy owl's breast. Slightly harder. Because we zoomed in a lot. Okay. Today's a bit of a moon one. Yeah. yeah. All I can say is, as I did because I'm a child, stick this in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> stick this in your pipe and smoke it. This is the reflection of a bird. And we want to know which species that mm. is. Tricky because it's all distorted, of course. Oh, so the, the things that you think you're looking at, the size oh. of the bill, everything is slightly off. Mm. It's not an easy one. Finally, I think we might have got you with that clip. So if you think you know the answers. Erin Clips from the fantastic photographer and naturalist Andy Rouse. He's been out exploring the wildlife on his doorstep, exploring what he can find and trying to take the best photos of it. And today, of course, is no exception. And he's just going around the corner from his house to photograph some fantastic, elegant birds, one of Britain's favourites. Well, here I am down at the lake and I, I just love being here and I'm so blessed that I'm actually living 30 seconds away. It's just an amazing place. You can see Sid here. Yeah, Chris, I've called him Sid. Um, he's fast asleep on the lake. He's just been drifting around slowly, slowly, slowly. It's so wonderful to watch. And you'll be pleased to know that Nancy, why do we call everything Sid and Nancy? Nancy's over there asleep as well. So I'm not sure what they've been doing uh, overnight, but obviously they're knackered and they're just time um, with them. And I will say to you, and I know that I'm very blessed to be here and you don't always have lakes in your back garden, um, but isolation and everything will end. We will get back to the nature that we love again. As the Queen said, we will meet again and there is another side to this. So when you get a chance, get out there to your local lake and enjoy the swans, but go just to photograph them. Go just, that's, that's all you do. You don't go and do anything else. You take your time, you look at the light, the situation, the setting, and you work the picture to get something elegant and something good out of it. If you don't, just like this morning I tried and I got absolutely nothing, you will still have the most brilliant time in nature because you'll be out at the best time of the day with the bird song, 
without much noise around of anything. It's great now, there's no airplanes overhead. It's just a wonderful, wonderful time to be out. <laughs> there's the postman arriving, believe it or not. <laughs> it's a wonderful time to be out in the morning. Um, and I just love photographing these guys, okay? It's just been fantastic. Now, one last thing I'm going to just say before I go. You know, Chris is really into his punk music. Brilliant, Chris, brilliant. Um, I know a secret about him. 1987, when we met, I had a perm. He had punk hair. It wasn't punk, he told me, that he was his biggest passion. It was Manilo. That's right, Barry Manilow's greatest hits. You know that when he pulls those records out of his record collection, that pink cover is Barry Manilow's greatest hits. Megan, you know it's true. Give him a tropical shirt, play Copacabana. He's there doing his shimmy, he can't help it. Chris, we wanna see that live on TV. I wanna see that admission about Manilow. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the past uh, few minutes seeing some of the wildlife I've done here. Um, it's just been the most amazing time uh, to photograph it. And it's testament as well to the farmer who's really managed this land for wildlife. It's just been incredible. And I've only scratched the surface of it, of course, because I'm limited as to how far I can go from the house. So all I will say to you all now is I just want you to open your windows, go into your garden, listen to birdsong, listen to nature, photograph it if you've got the chance because your mental health is really important right now. And at this time, we're all in isolation doing something. Thank you, Keith. <laughs> we're all in isolation doing something uh, that we're not used to. And we can all get a bit stir crazy. Listening to nature helps you reset and get back to normality for a short time at least. All right, I'm gonna sit and, and watch the swans now and, and just enjoy the rest of the morning. Here's some pictures that I've taken of them. And after that, I'll be back to Chris and Megan Thanks for your wonderful show. Keep up the good work, guys. See you again. Manilow. I, I don't know. I've, 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 I don't know anything about Barry Manilow. I've never heard a single Barry Manilow song, as far as. <laughs> so you said you were feeling a bit rubbish this morning. So I thought that and that's made me are. feel. That's made me feel a lot better. I have to say, yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, listen, Andy Rouse is an exceptional photographer. Um, I won't get into his taste in music at this point in time, but let me just say it's decidedly dodgy. And he's trying to fake news me with the man alone. I can see it. Trust me. <laughs> oh, come it's on. Oh, I've known you for uh, 25 years. Have I ever man alone? All the time. That's what oh, I dropped in the car. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, his photographs of swans were pretty special, we have to say. He, he, he's a great photographer. But all week, I've been going on and on about his great crested grebe photographs. So we thought it probably pertinent for you to see these photographs. So take a look at them. Here they are now. Oh, my goodness me. The bocal on the water. Mm, they're the, golden. I know. Oh, the backlit headdresses. And of course, they're standing up and doing their <sighs> weed display. But it's the colour, really, and, and the lighting is just... Exceptional, and the fact that, of course, he's very low to the water, he's looking right across the surface of that water at those greaves. Exceptional work, Andy Rouse, and you can find more of his work at Wildman Rouse on Instagram and Twitter. He's principally active on Instagram. Yeah, deal with the poos, please. Um, thank you. Um, and also try to check out his wild, wild angle views. If you go to Andy's website, andyrouse.co.uk, he's got his. Um, tutorials there wild angle views and they're really good as well thanks to Andy he's going out over the weekend he's going to try and photograph some mason bees active over the weekend so we might have more from Andy next week if he's successful thanks Andy for your contribution mm -hmm. now 
coming up our live camera of the day we've tried to get around the world and vary this in terms of species take a look at this one i like this one a lot this is an egyptian vulture's nest in bulgaria i love that so distinctive with that orange and yellow head changes more towards orange during the breeding season that gorgeous plumage i mean they are just you know a bird to be reckoned with aren't yeah they? nesting in a cave here now, you can find the site on YouTube under the scientific name of the Egyptian vulture, which is Neophon Ternoterus. Ternoterus. Neophon Ternoterus. That's it. <laughs> and it's interesting because Neophon was a figure in Greek mythology. He was a young lad, and his mother was having an affair with a friend of his, i.e. someone of his own age, and he was particularly offended by this. So he affected a... Well, what, how can I put it delicately? A nefarious stunt. And as a consequence of that stunt, which went badly wrong, Zeus, the king of the do uh, gods, um, turned him into a vulture. So basically that's how it gets its name. Bit of uh, Greek mythology for you there. Um, fantastic animals, though, Egyptian vultures. Mm -hmm. Found in southern Europe. Um, Luke Massey was talking about the opportunity of seeing one of his uh, farm in Spain mm -hmm. when we had him on uh, last week. Um, you find them, yeah, southern Spain, few in southern France might still be left there, North Africa, and then all the way across into Asia. And there's another band of distribution below the Sahara uh, as well. But what's interesting about them is that they're one of the few birds, I mean, there are a few, um, that actually use tools. And they use a stone, a pebble, to break open ostrich eggs. I've got a photograph here of this happen. The photograph was uh, taken by Ger Bosma. And this shows an Egyptian vulture smashing open um, an ostrich egg. It's not the only tool use that they do, though. I think Megs is desperate to tell you about another one, because I didn't I know this. a very this. bad poodle who's uh, sitting on the naughty bench with me. Um, so, yes, what they do as well is they will go out and they will find twigs, which they will constantly be laying on their nest to build it up throughout the breeding season. But what they do is they'll find wool and they'll find hair, and they will uh, delicately wrap the wool and the hair around the twig to line their nest with to keep it even more insulated. So they make like a sort of, a, like a, uh, I don't know how you describe it really, a twig covered in water. Yeah, and they twist it round and they insulate it properly. It's really interesting. And you're saying about the stone thing. Um, they will actually walk metres away from the egg, like lo a long distance away, mm. to find the perfect pebble. The perfect pebble. The perfect pebble for breaking. It has to, of course, be a good weight enough because those ostrich eggs are quite thick and quite tough, aren't they? So they need a really oh, good... Yeah. A really good pebble to really help break that. Open. Anyway, you can keep your eyes on that uh, nest. It's on YouTube. Egyptian Vulture New Life is the project name. Uh, fantastic stuff. A great bird as well. Mm. Absolutely great bird. Now, after speaking to Hedgehog Hugh, Hugh Warwick, yesterday, he sent us this photograph by Gerard Onk. Meg, this is, I, I, do you know, I didn't know anything about this. You better tell everyone because yeah. you found out and, and surprised me. So, one of the main predators of hedgehogs, surprisingly, is large owl species. Lots of large owls will come and um, attack hedgehogs. And the reason being is because owls are so, so silent. Of course, they have to be as a nocturnal predator. But when they go and try and attack the hedgehog, they're so quiet that the hedgehog doesn't have time to roll up into a ball and defend itself. And therefore, they are much more susceptible to predation from these large owls which is pretty cool but the eagle owl in europe is didn't you say to me that it was eating 41 percent of his diet 41.7 percent of what? the hedgehog. eagle owl's diet is hedgehog That's so the most predominant prey species for them is hedgehog. that is astonishing i i had no idea mm. i mean i'm not a, 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 an eagle owl expert by any measure i've had the fortune to see them a few times i had no idea they're eating so many hedgehogs so many hedgehogs yeah it's a huge part of the biomass of their diet um, when you're able to calculate it, which is really interesting. It's the kind of the last thing you expect them to really be eating. They do. Fantastic stuff. Uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, a man called uh, Joe Harkness contacted me through social media and told me that he was going to be writing a, a book about his experiences of mental health and his recovery through engaging with birds, developing a love for bird watching. Um, he sent me some of the inaugural chapters, and I was really pleased to watch this book evolve. It's called Bird Therapy. Um, uh, an exceptional book, I've got to say. Mm. It really is uh, an exceptional read. Um, covers, I mean, if you've keen interest in, in, in ornithology, it's great as, uh, as well as anything else. Um, but more importantly, this is a book about a man who discovers a method of using nature as a cure. 
So we've asked Joe to make a little film for us about how he does this and continues to do so, I have to say, most importantly. Here's Joe. Birds and nature are my anchor to the present. They're constant and reliable in a way that people rarely are. Perhaps a reason why I and many others turn to them at times when nothing else seems to help. Even when the world around us is a dark place, the birds still sing, they still migrate, they're just there, being, in a way that perhaps we all aspire to be ourselves. My name's Joe Harkness, and I'm the author of Bird Therapy, a book exploring my recovery journey and the benefits of bird watching for mental health and well-being. So I was looking through my bird records and today is the day that swifts normally return back to the skies above where I live. Now I haven't seen one yet and uh, I'm not getting my hopes up because it's a little bit windy and um, I'm used to seeing them in slightly stiller conditions when they return. But what I want to say is that this consistency of knowing that today is the day that these birds might return is one of those magical qualities of getting to know our birds locally and further afield as well. But it's particularly the local birds right now that are so important and so important for our well-being, which is what I'm going to speak about. I just want to show you something. If I turn the camera, you see this wall just here. A week ago, just over a week ago, I had a black red start pop up on my garage roof, which is up there, and then feed from this wall across to that fence there and backwards and forwards between the two all afternoon and it was absolutely amazing and completely unexpected another beautiful thing about birds and it's that balance of the consistent and the unknown that i think makes it such an intriguing and beneficial pastime so we're out on one of our morning exercise walks which we've been doing every day during lockdown and they've been imperative for our well-being Thinking back to my five ways to well birding, connect, be active, give, learn, and take notice. All five really apply when we're out. So we're active, we're walking, um, taking in fresh air, landscapes, wildlife, um, and just being together, which is that whole connecting part. Um, I give some of my knowledge and love for the area to my daughter and we take notice of the things around us. This morning we've had our first white throats of the year and a lesser white throat as well, which is fantastic. Lots of other warblers singing too. Uh, really beautiful, even though it's a little bit breezy. And it's also that whole learning process. We're learning about where we live more and more each day. Those calendars of nature, which I love so much, those patterns of stability that being outdoors and loving the local area brings us. I honestly don't think there's a better a more important time for people to read bird therapy. And now that it's available in paperback, I hope it reaches even more people. Thank you for watching. Top bloke. So good, you know, mm. sharing his story about how nature and birding has improved his mental health, which is so important for us all. And it's a fantastic book, of course, to read. So you can now get Bird Therapy by Joe Harkness on paperback as well. But one thing I really, really wanted to mention is that Joe has created a fantastic teaching pack, which is free for all to download on his website. His website is Joe, J-O-E, Harkness, H-A-R-K-N-E-S-S. -S, .co.uk and also you can follow him on Instagram as well where he is sharing a lot of his stories so make sure to download that free teaching pack it's a fantastic resource for kids yeah. and yourself while you're at home so make sure to do that. He's remarkably honest about his uh, various issues I suppose mm -hmm. and um, and it's only through that degree of honesty that we can ever begin to confront these things so these books I think are incredibly important and Joe's stands out there as being one of the best in recent times absolutely no doubt about that. Okay now we're pleased to introduce our live guest my great mate mm -hmm. martin hughes games just before we came on we were having an enlivened conversation about the battle of midway martin and i share a keen interest in all things second world war or any war actually we love battles and all sorts of things um, but we're not going to be talking battles today martin i hope are we we're going to move on to something else what have you been up to <laughs> What he's up to is technical difficulties <laughs> at this point. Hold I haven't on. quite worked out the unmute button yet. Okay. I think it's frozen. <laughs> uh, 
I tell you what, why don't we, whilst we're, hey, hold on, let's just, just give, him, give, him another, give him another couple of seconds to see if this works. And, and then there's a hand waving. And, <laughs> nice and, uh, oh, oh, and, it's and there's back his door. To it's gone back to front. <laughs> you can see his conservatory door yes. there. It's a fantastic place. Oh, hey, we're, we're, we're now we're around the, we're at the back window. Hang on. How do we do it the other way around? <laughs> I don't know. How do we, why are we at the back window? <laughs> Just tap, tap, tap the there we go. Hey! There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that little technical interlude. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, that makes it lie. Now, Chris, um, we've had a very happy event down here, a bit like our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. No, no, okay. No, we've had a very happy event to do with chickens. Now, what happened was that Nana's chickens got attacked by a predator unknown so we said that we would try to to bring some on in my incubator so here's a photograph of the incubator with the eggs going in lovely okay and that was on the you can see that was on the first of april and it takes about um 21 days as you know and after 21 days the magic happened have a look at this fabulous Is it happening? Thanks, Fabian. Fabian, keep just tell me what's go what's happening with the clip because I can't see it. Brilliant. I mean, it's just complete magic. And here's an incredible thing. You know, the heart, when you incubate, when they start to incubate the egg, the heart starts beating after about 44 hours only of incubation. And it's not inside the, the, the body of the chick. There's two different blood systems. The chick's got one and there's one all the way around the egg. And it's not until the seventh day that the heart actually goes into the body of the chick. <laughs> Absolutely amazing eggs. Now, when they come out, the chicks are a little bit sort of soggy, as you saw. But then, hang on, <laughs> they turn into this. Oh, look at that! Aren't they lovely? It's amazing how quickly that they um they sort of their wing feathers grow. We think this is a boy and a girl, but they, as you can see, they look a little bit more attractive once they've dried off. Gorgeous! Right back we go. Come on, lads. Ugh. My wife will name them soon. <laughs> now uh, we have every year quite um well the last three years a rather exotic visitor has come we feel very very honored and the exotic visitor comes into the shed over there and and i i went out to try we never know if he's going to be there or not so i went out to try to see if the exotic summer visitor was actually in the shed right here's the shed um, we call it Angus's shed for complicated reasons. Anyway, inside the shed, all the gardening tools, um, ladders, um, pots and, you know, all the gardening paraphernalia. And a few years ago, three years ago, not two, three years ago, I went in the shed, looked up at the roof and I saw something almost unbelievable. Oh, there's pit ratting. So let's go in. We've got to do this very, very quietly and quite quickly. Uh, Let's see if we can see. Excuse me, Sam. Right, come on in. I have no idea if it'll be here. Look up at the roof. I am being quiet, darling. Can you see it? Oh, yes, it's there. Right, right, right. right. I'll just shine very quickly. Look up there. See? Can you see it? It's a it's a lesser horseshoe bat. Um, if it's plum size, I'll do it again. Let's have a quick look. We don't need to look. There it is. See? Like I say, three years ago, that bat. I mean, I feel so honoured. Decided to come and live in our shed. And what happens is that during the 
the uh, winter, he disappears. I don't know where he goes to. I think it's a male. And then in the summer, he turns up again. And I'll show you how he gets in and out. Have a look over here. Watch out, Sam. The dog pit. Can you see? <laughs> that window, I've never, ever shut that window, ever. And that must be how he gets in and out. And you can tell that for sure because the ladder underneath is absolutely covered in bat poo. Can you see? All this bat poo everywhere. They have very busy little bottoms. Anyway, we're so honoured that he's there. Let's, let's just go out. Well, actually, I'm just going to try one thing just to see if he's awake. I've got my bat detector. Ooh. Batteries run out. We won't do that experiment now. We might do that later. Come on, let's go out and not disturb him. Come on, out we go. Come on, Sam, out we get. Batteries always run out on you when you're least expecting it. Anyway, he seemed, that, that bat seemed very, very relaxed and well, it, it didn't seem active at all. So I think he was absolutely fast asleep. And, and obviously bats tend to start to wake up as it's getting towards sundown. So what I did, fitted the new battery and went back as the light was beginning to go when I thought he'd probably be a little bit more active. Now, in this next clip, I just want to point out, I got so overexcited, I called him a long-eared bat. As you'll hear my wife pointing out, it's not a long-eared bat, it's a lesser horseshoe bat. But let's see if he will talk to us now as we go back in at sundown. Okay, I've changed the battery now. Um, and I've got to be honest, I went back in and I listened in to the bat. Shush, Pip. And nothing. No sound, nothing at all. So I think he was fast asleep, not bothered by us being there at all. Right, OK, now it's half past six. I think he'll be waking up. So let's go in, if he's still there, and try to see if he's saying anything. Let me just turn it on. Hang on. Just get the frequency right. It's about 111. OK, come on, let's go on in. Tweaking noise like an alien. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the sound of a long eared bat. Let's see if we can see him now. Isn't that wonderful? That's the noise he made. Where is he? Where is he? Very effective. No, no, no. Sorry. Said that's the I know it's wrong. I did it wrong. A horseshoe bat. Just no, no, carry on. That's a lesser horseshoe. My wife's put me right. But isn't that the most wonderful sound? What did you talk to you? One more time. So the... Actually, the calls are in... Are in, um... With him with his face as well. I don't want to disturb him too much. But let me just... A couple of amazing things. Isn't that fantastic? So he's very alert now. Okay, do the pip. Come on out. Pip, pip, come out. Come on. An honour to have a, a, a bat living in our shed. We're deeply on. Here's an amazing thing about that. How long do you think that, that that lesser horseshoe might live for? I mean, maximum length, possibly 20 years. Could be even more than that. How can they do that? Because something like a mouse, maybe similar sort of size, you're lucky to get past a year if you're a mouse. So how can a bat, a tiny little bat, live as long as that? I want to research it some more. It's something to do with the way they're able to shut down their metabolism as they hibernate, which mice can't do, but absolutely amazing. Now, did you notice, did you get a glimpse in the shed of that fantastic racing motorcycle, a Triumph? Yep, folks, let's have a look at me racing my Triumph motorcycle. Sadly, just a still. That was probably the most exciting thing that ever happened to me until I started working with Chris. Okay, quickly, one final thing. 
Now, uh, behind me here, there's a Catoni Aster, which um, in the evening is absolutely buzzing with bees. There's some bees on it now, but we've had a very, very exotic visitor uh, to, to this, uh, something that I normally see um, in the autumn, not in the springtime. But have a look at this insect monster. There's a monster inside this wall. Don't find it in your car when you go. Hornet. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Where's it gone? Where is it? Look at us all filming the hornet. Not surprising because it's so exciting. Where is it, love? It's gone in that hole. Presumably, this is a queen. Looking for somewhere to build its nest. <laughs> I love that sort of deep pitch drone. So this is a hornet looking for somewhere to nest, to create a nest. But look at the size of it and that wonderful deep droning sound. Surely one of our most magnificent insects. Gosh, that's thrilling. <gasps> Harpy. Hornets. I mean, the most surely, possibly, arguably, the most thrilling of all our insects. People model them up. Uh, with, with other uh, wood wasps and things like that. But it's unmistakable when you see a hornet, they've got that tawny colour. Here's a still of a hornet, that lovely tawny colour, not so yellow as a wasp, and up to maybe twice the size of a wasp. Magnificent creatures. Lovely. I love a hornet, me. OK, that's it. Um, Chris, I'd just like to say, we'd like to say that um, coming up is a, a very special time for you, mate. Oh. So... Um, if, oh. you, if you, you know, <laughs> let me know what you want as a little prezzy um, and, um, and happy shh when it comes up. All the best. Martin, um, if that's very kind of you to offer a gift, could I have Barry Manilow's Greatest Hits, please? Oh, you happen to have a copy of it, mate. Yes. I'm happy to send it to you. It's Joe's. <laughs> um, I think we've got a couple of questions for you, if that's all oh, right. Oh, yes, yes. A few bits and pieces coming in. So... Martin, what is your favourite season and why? I think it's got to be spring because it's sort of new hope, new dawn. Everything happens in spring. So autumn a close second, but it's, it's spring. It fills me with hope. Gorgeous time of year. Um, someone else would like to know which bat detector you were using. Oh, blimey. I don't know it's... I don't know its name. It's not the really fancy one that Chris has got that fits onto your iPad. Um, it's a little, oh, I can't, I can't remember its name. I'm sorry. I'll take a photo of it and post it to you. Oh, sorry, Perfect. We can put that in the comments a little bit later on. Um, and the final question, um, and this is, a, this is a very serious one, Martin. This is from Brett Rumfit. Martin, why do you have so many lamps in your shed? <laughs> 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 it was good question very good question. it was it was because when we got married it was a thing because in india you know in india often if you go to india in a camp they've got these beautiful paraffin lamps everywhere and it's such a beautiful light so when joe and i got married we had paraffin lamps absolutely everywhere and now of course they're completely useless <laughs> i'll sell them off i'll sell them off a quid each no, no, <laughs> two quid Oh, that's lovely, though. It's a nice story. Right? <laughs> Mate, if you sold all of those power pin lamps on an uh, internet auction site, you could probably get yourself another classic motorcycle. Oh, Chris, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Try <Trial. laughs> <You're> your chicks. <laughs> Martin, thanks ever so much for joining us as ever. An absolute pleasure. Another bat in the shed, hornet mm. on the Catoni Aster, and a chick in the hand. I mean, what more can we ask for? Just yeah. pip the dog. I don't know where she is. Well, keep, keep the dog away from the chicks. We'd have to do that here with the poods, I have to say. <laughs> Never show the try and mix. Okay, yeah, Thanks have a great much, weekend. Martin. Cheers, Martin. Bye. 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 Right. So, last week we had a clip from Lee Gardner at Project Dark. Was it last week? No, the week before. The week before, I guess.
So from Lee Gardner at Project Diaries, and he was showing us how to do some clippings. Now, whilst we're all at home, one of the great things that we can do is start, you know, playing around, improving our green thumb. I'm not very green fingered myself, but, you know, I'm really inspired by this. He's now showing very simply in our own Hi guys, my name's Lee Gardner and I run a YouTube channel called Project Diaries and I changed my life a few years ago when I built this shed for free in my granddad's garden and it's been amazing ever since. But today I want to do a tutorial and show you how to grow tomatoes. It's so easy to do so I'm going to try and do it as quickly as I can and inspire you to do it at home. There's no need to buy seeds for this tutorial, just get yourself a juicy tomato, one that you like. What you want to do is try to get yourself an organic heirloom but if not you can get a hybrid and really experiment to see what kind of flavour you're going to get out of them. Then all you need to do is cut them down the centre and extract the seeds. The same technique works for all kinds of tomatoes, it doesn't matter whether you've got cherry tomatoes, standard tomatoes, beef tomatoes, they all grow in exactly the same way and they're all as easy as each other. You can also save the seeds for another year. Just dry them out on a paper towel and make sure that all the slimy stuff is off them. Once the seeds are nice and dry, get yourself a tray. It really doesn't matter what you use to start these off and you need some multi-purpose compost. Just poke your finger in. You want to sow the seeds around three times the depth. And to save yourself more time later on, just make sure you put one or two seeds per pod. Once you've placed all the seeds in, you just then need to cover them up and then just water them in. Now you might not need to water these every day. You just need to make sure that the soil is moist at all times and then just leave this on a warm windowsill for around a week. Within as little as five days you should see the seedlings trying to push through the soil and here they are just after a week. These are my beef tomatoes just two weeks in. Once they get to around a three week mark it's good to transplant them into something bigger. Now the great thing about growing tomatoes is that they have a really shallow root system so you can pretty much grow them anywhere including anything from raised beds, grow bags or even a bucket. Just squeeze the base of the pot and allow the roots to come out nicely and then just prise them out to help these then grow into the new soil. Unlike other plants, you can bury tomatoes as deep as you want. They will grow roots all the way from the stem no matter how deep that you bury them. If you're a veganic gardener, you definitely want to skip this part, but it's a really good idea to give it a good boost of calcium at the beginning and the best source is from eggshells. This will break down and become plant available over the next month and will hopefully stop something called blossom end rot. Once you've buried the plant, backfill the soil and push it down but don't pack it down too deeply because you still want the roots to establish. Now at this point you want to give it a really good deep watering daily. When the plant starts to mature you want to cut off the lower leaves this will stop something called blight, which is a fungus that will take over your plant and stop it from producing fruit or spoil them. This will also stop slugs from using these as a ladder and eating all of your fruit. Now if you planted these in some really rich nutritious soil and you've remembered to water daily, you should start seeing some lovely ripe tomatoes between 40 and 50 days after planting and I can guarantee they will be some of the juiciest tomatoes you've ever eaten. So give them a try. And it's as easy as that. Hopefully you can have that much success at home if you try it yourself. If you want to see some more tutorials, don't forget to check out youtube.com forward slash Project Diaries HQ. In the meantime, that's enough from me. Stay safe and I'll see you next time. Over to you, Chris and Megan. Homegrown tomatoes. Yeah. I mean, oh, they look so delicious and something so easy to do. Just get the seeds out and dry them off and put them in. I mean, even I could maybe do it. Even, well, come on then. What, that's well, all, okay. That, okay. We well, need to I, get a bit of compost. But okay, I think I'll there's give it plenty of compost. This is, this is compost. We're surrounded that's by true. compost. <laughs> I'm knee deep in compost. Yeah. And listen, I've been doing some growing of my own. Oh, no. Yes, yes, I have. Well, growing, is that a push? I've been growing these mushrooms. They look a bit... Yeah, I know, these are the ones that we didn't harvest, okay? So uh, yesterday we harvested some mushrooms from my my, my growing. You know, I toiled when over you say these... Growing, when you say growing, you mean you bought this box, you bought it off of Instagram, and it's just got all of your trousers. You put a hole in it, you made it down, but you put it in a, in a dark room for... I, you know, you didn't nurture it, you didn't care for it, you didn't transplant different pots, you didn't 
you know, it mm. wasn't an ongoing kind of love, was it? It was For just someone a, who's been so it. negative about my mushrooms. You certainly tucked into them last night I when think, we were I having them with our <laughs> Beyond Meat burgers. Last they were good. Night. They, they were good. very, very good. I've got they this actually tasty. on Instagram. You're right. And I, all I did was add water, and this enormous crop came up. We can cut these away now. I'm going to get a couple Within more. Within days, it just yeah. like erupted. Lee Gardner would be really. I know, careful, I know. Careful. Lee Gardner would be very proud of my 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 endeavours. My yeah. mushroom cultivation in the boiler room i don't know about that i mean it's a great device if you know if you're not that skilled like me if you're not very skilled at kind of growing things then you know it's a great way of doing it tasted it. delicious it proof of the puddings good. in the tasting they were tasty it did taste tasty very good mushrooms. but i hope many of you are going to be going out and growing your own tomatoes i know i'm going to try um so on to a few birthdays there's a few very special birthdays today andy rouse's daughter Sabrina, age five. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Sabrina. Yeah, I hope you're having a fantastic day. Um, so Charlotte, who is 10 years old, would like to wish her mother, Pearl, a happy 38th birthday. Happy birthday to you, Pearl. Um, Jill Merchant is 71 today. Olivia, five years old today. Um, also, Caroline and Otis's birthday as well. So happy birthday to everyone. I hope you have a fantastic Friday and can enjoy the rest of your week. Now, the rest of the weekend, what does it entail? Well, typically for us, we have two days off because we've struggled with our bandwidth at the weekend. Mm -hmm. But not this weekend, because Sunday is International Dawn Chorus Day. So we and the RSPB are going to be getting up very early on Sunday morning, and we're inviting mm -hmm. you to do exactly the same. I mean, you could watch it recorded later at 9 o'clock whilst you're tucking mm -hmm. into your toast and marmalade, or you could be up at 5 o'clock. That's when the yeah. RSPB are starting their dawn chorus output at five o'clock in the morning. And that's going on until seven. We're going to pick up straight off the back. So we'll be live at 7 a.m. We've asked people from all over Europe, indeed the world, to record birdsong uh, this week so that we can play mm -hmm. it out um, on Sunday morning. And Megan and I will be out, not here, but we'll be taking our hours exercise very early out in the woods, a few hundred metres away from the house, trying to uh, mm -hmm. listen to some bird song there. So you can join mm -hmm. us at seven uh, between 7 and 7.30 mm -hmm. on Sunday morning. It's not quite dawn course by then, we would have missed it, but we'll catch the tail end of it. Plenty of guests, as I say. And this afternoon at 3 o'clock, Megan and I are joining my partner, Charlotte Corney, and she is doing a Facebook Live from the Wild Heart Trust on the Isle of Wight. And you can catch that on the Wild Heart Trust Facebook page or on my Facebook page. So it's going to be some exotic exotic animals. Rescued animals, rescued animals, exotic rescued animals mm. this afternoon at three o'clock. You might want to join us then. So plenty more going on. Lots to be busy over the weekend. Yeah, busy for you yeah. because you're going to be growing tomatoes and I should be <laughs> savouring my mushrooms. <laughs> Oh, well. oh right. hold on, the quiz. Oh, good. Ah, ah, this, is, this is where I finally get one over on everyone. So I asked you what this was the reflection of. What mm. this was the reflection of. What was this? So tell me. Uh, come on, please. Tell me. You know what? It wasn't as hard as we maybe thought. Oh, well, I don't know. On. Maybe it was. I don't know. Facebook, Julie, Martin, Terry, Matt, Tim, Claire, Lindsay. Uh, Twitter, Paul, Mark, James, Andrew, Morgan, Chris, Mike, YouTube, Paula, Stuart and Simon. Well, they got it right. They got it right. Yes, well okay. done to all of you. It was a tricky one, you know. Northern Fulmar. Let's see the photo now. Look at that beautiful golden backdrop. Something Andy Rouse would be very mm. pleased with, I think. Yeah, that was light bouncing off a sandstone cliff over some still water. The photograph was actually taken in Greenland near the Storr Glacier Yeah, mm. in 2012. 2012 in July of 2012. I can, I can probably remember the day, but we won't go there. It's all a bit too Asperger's. But however, um, yeah. So there we are. So a few people got it right. The quiz is never difficult enough. Congratulations mm. to those people. It was quite tricky. It was tricky. It was a difficult one. I would have struggled with that, you know, because as I said it's all distorted. You know, everything mm. that you'd normally be able to ID a bird on the beak length, the mm. width, the tail feathers, the shape, everything's just a little bit off because, of course, it's reflection. So it's mm. a tricky one. Mm. A little bit mean as they. integral part of the photograph, though. On one occasion, I spent a whole afternoon just photographing mm. the reflections of four miles, not the birds themselves, just their reflections. Um, maybe should have used one of those they're even more abstract but I think a new quiz for next week I think a new quiz for next week and perhaps we'll have a special show on Monday a special birthday show what do you think about that? time to go folks have <laughs> a great weekend <laughs> bye everyone bye bye, bye. <laughs>